funny. Um, and my daddy loved me because he plays with me a lot. Cause he gives me kisses. She's always um nice to me. Because he's a nice dad and he makes the funniest dad jokes ever. Um, we go to the swimming pool all the time. Go to a pool. Mm, jokes. What do you call a seagull that flies over a bay? I don't know. A bagel. Chicken. Chicken. Uh, his favorite food is, I mean, food is, I think, pizza. Um, strawberries. Um, sandwiches. All of the food. Vegetables. Tools. A water bottle. I'm tired. I would like to call her him a unicorn. A fishing. I like to play with him. To play with him. Um, um it's a um, dog every Play games. Happy Father's Day. 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 I broke this. David say Happy Father's Day. I broke it on your snore. Happy Father's Day. Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, happy Father's Day. My name is Abby and I'm so glad that you all are here to worship with us this morning. Uh, I want to invite you all to let us know where you're watching from, uh, how your week's been. We want to hear from you. Uh, and if you're new, let us, uh, let us know that you're here. Type the word new and uh, we will be in contact with you. Um, but let's open up in prayer. Dear God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for, for all the things that you give us, all the gifts and blessings, God, that we don't deserve, but you lend to us anyway. God, we ask that as we go through this time of worship, that you can hear our prayers, that you can hear our prayers of praise and thanks for the things that you're doing, and God, also that you can hear our concerns and the worries on our hearts. God, we thank you for this amazing grace that you give to us. We're so thankful, and we love you. It's all in your name. Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole
done for me. Good morning. My name is Michael Scott, and I'm the pastor here at Woods Chapel Blue Springs, and I just want to thank you for joining us this morning. Now, I want to wish all the fathers out there a happy Father's Day, uh, and to all you mothers who maybe you fulfill that role in a child's life. Um, so happy today we celebrate that, and we also celebrate that yesterday was the official kickoff to summer. And so I'm wearing my Hawaiian shirt in celebration of that. And it was also the longest day of the year. So I am an outdoor person. I love sunshine. I love being outdoors. And yesterday uh, was the longest day of sunshine. So from here on out, they just get shorter all the way until December 21st. Uh, but today I'm celebrating that. And I want to invite you to celebrate the same way. And of course, we've been talking about chaos in our communities. And how can we go from chaos into community? And each week we've been talking with people and interviewing people of color and listening to their stories about how we can change, about things that we can do. We've also been talking about stories from the Bible, of things that have been chaotic in our history, that we've been able to take and, and read about them where we can see that they've made changes. And so I've been inviting everyone to talk about and to post on here, what are some of the things, some of the chaos, and hopefully some of the community that you have seen around you. Just this week, I'm a part of a group in Blue Springs called the Rotary Club of Blue Springs. And they, uh, our board decided that we wanted to make a statement. We wanted to contribute to the solution of systemic racism in our country. And so our board uh, voted to commission a piece of art, hopefully, where we could uh, have people participate in some kind of collective piece of art that we're going to put on a building in downtown Blue Springs that tells the story of our racism in our country and hopefully ways in which we can come back together and combat that racism and come together as a community. So I'm looking forward to what that turns into and what that looks like, but it gave me hope. It gave me hope that there are good people out there who are trying to make a difference. And I, I wanna invite you to share your stories. What are your stories? Where are you seeing good in our community right now, even though amidst all this chaos? And so we're in week four of the series. In the first week, we talked about how Jesus addresses racism by making the people of his day, the Samaritans, the people who were thought of as less than, he took their stories, or he took stories and he elevated them and made them the hero. And we talked to my good friend Clarence, and he got to share with us his story about his experience as a black man and his experience with racism and challenged us to make a difference and to do things to make changes in our lives. The second week we talked about how, uh, from our origins in the Bible, that from the very beginning in Genesis, that the earth is chaotic, it's this chaotic mass. And from that chaotic mass, when God is involved, that from that something beautiful came of it. And we find the story of Adam and Eve in this beautiful place called the Garden of Eden. And God challenges us to, be, to have dominion over all the things on the earth, that we are to create community from that chaos, just like he showed us. And we talked to our good friend, Chloe, and Chloe told her experience, her story as a black woman, about her experience in America with racism. Last week, we talked to my friend, <clears throat> excuse me, my friend Danica. And Danica shared her story, and, and we got to hear from her, and she challenged us in new, new ways. 
And we talked about um, the story of, of uh, Abram and Sarai and how they were 90 and 100 years old. And God comes to them and says, you're going to have a child. And this child is going to be, you're going to have descendants, many, 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 many descendants. And uh, they're, they kind of laughed at God. Uh, but God came to them and said, listen, I'm making a covenant with you that this is going to happen, even at your age. And uh, he makes this covenant of circumcision with the men, right? And circumcision is the removal of something that it should change us, it should be hard, that change is difficult. And even ask Abram and Sarai to change their names to Abraham and to Sarah. And of course, um, well, not of course, but, but she doesn't have a baby right away. She doesn't get pregnant. So uh, Sarah goes to Abraham and says, listen, I have uh, this servant, her name is Hagar, have a child with her. And so uh, Hagar and Abraham have a child together, and his name is Ishmael. Of course, Sarah would get pregnant later, and they would have a son named Isaac. And today I want to read about uh, that story. Now, this story picks up about the time Isaac is being weaned. And so if you're following along with me, I'm reading from Genesis 21. Uh, and in Genesis 21, uh, starting with verse 8, we read this. It says, The child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham was mocking. And so you have um, Ishmael mocking Isaac. And Sarah doesn't like this. She's in, and she said to Abraham, get rid of that woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. And really it concerned both his sons. And so you have this, uh, um, this celebration of Isaac um, being weaned, and they're celebrating this, and Isaac and Ishmael are uh, in some kind of combat, some kind of uh, discourse, or they're fighting, and Sarah gets involved and says, you know what, Ishmael and Hagar got to go. And she tells Abraham to kick them out. And so here's what Abraham does. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. When she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. I love the fact that somebody who has been marginalized, that God sees that person. Of course, Ishmael's descendants are our Islam brothers and sisters. Our brothers and sisters of the Muslim faith, they all come from Ishmael, from Hagar and Ishmael. And of course, our descendants uh, from our faith, from the Jewish culture, all come from Isaac. And if you know anything about Jews and Christians and Islam or the Muslim faith, they have been at war with each other for millennia. And it's because of this one event. This one event where one person gets jealous and upset at somebody else and casts them out and treats them differently and shuns them and pushes them to the edges. From that one event, we've had centuries of war, of killing, and of unnecessary violence. I like to use that story because I think it applies to us today. I have people tell me, Mike, I didn't start slavery. I didn't own slaves. I don't participate in this, and now I would challenge that. I think we all participate in racism. But I want to point out that we didn't start this war. I'll, I'll, I'll agree to that. Uh, maybe it was our ancestors. Maybe our ancestors did or did not participate in slavery. The point isn't who started it. The point isn't that, the, the, that we participated in that. The point is that it is ours to deal with right now and today. Just like our, our brothers, our Jewish brothers and sisters, and our Muslim brothers and sisters, there is a problem. There is still conflict, and we see a lot of this in the Middle East. There are still wars fought over this. And those people that, that are currently fighting these wars, they didn't start that war. But it is theirs and ours to resolve, much like the, the racism that exists in our country. It is ours to solve. It is ours to do something about. And so this week, as we continue to talk about racism, as we think about the story of Ishmael and Isaac and Hagar and Sarah and that conflict and how it still is with us today, so is racism. And so this week I was able to interview a good friend of mine, and he got to share his story with us. And so I invite you to take a listen. 
Uh, good morning, everybody. This week, we have an awesome opportunity to get to hear from one of my good friends. Um, his name is Lucas Boyce, and uh, Lucas and I grew up together, and we, we've done a lot of things together, actually. We played basketball together, uh, lots of nights staying at each other's houses, eating pizza and Twizzlers, and uh, <laughs> Lucas is a dear friend. Grape soda. Grape soda. Oh, grape soda. Yes, we had so many good nights at each other's houses. Uh, it, Lucas is quite the accomplished uh, young man. I say young man. We're the same age, aren't we, Lucas? So if I say you're a young 41? man, I guess that. Are you 41? Yeah. I am. You're a month before me, April 18th. I'm May 19th. So yeah. That's right. That's right. Our birthday. Yeah, we're, we're even almost the same age. And so uh, Lucas has done a lot of things. One of the things Lucas has done is uh, Lucas wrote a book called Living Proof from Foster Care to the White House to the NBA. And um, Lucas is going to tell you about some of his experiences and we're going to talk about race and relations and um, some of his experience in life. But he's also done so many cool things and cool things like uh, been on Air Force One with the president. And so I'm not going to take up any more time. Uh, so, Lucas, um, we want to hear from you. So, of course, right now in our country, we are experiencing um, tensions in race. We're experiencing uh, difficulties in communicating is what I would say. Um, and... I would say specifically that white people are struggling to hear the black narratives is what it seems like to me. That's at least part of the struggle. And so um, just talk to us about your experience. I know in the book, um, you have a whole section on um, talking about um, race and it's actually titled identity and race where you talk about some of your experiences. Yeah. And so yeah. Um, I'm just going to kind of hand it over to you. I want you to tell us what you think is going on right now. Tell us about some of your experience and we'll, we'll just kind of go from there. Okay. Well, I, I can't unequivocally tell you what's going on right now because there are a number of different things going on right now, but I will maybe just start from my experience. Um, my experience is a lot different than a lot of black people and other people that look like me because I have a multicultural family. And I'll share this with you. I want to share how I grew up and why it's so difficult to understand some of the things that are going on in our nation right now because of how I was raised. You know, my, um, my adopted mother, her name's Dorothy, and I'm sharing her on the screen there. And um, not to make, a, to make a long story short, my birth mother had me at age 19. Uh, she could not take care of me. Um, she had everything going for her and she got mixed up with the wrong kind of things. And um, her life went sideways. Um, and in the midst of that, um, I was created and uh, I needed a place to stay. I was uh, impacted by uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, um, developmental delay because of some of the choices my birth mom made uh, while she was pregnant with me. And so I was in the hospital in the NICU for 10 days um, after being born uh, to try and verify whether I was viable, whether I was going to be able to make it because I was about six weeks premature um, and weighing about four pounds, two ounces, right? So in 1979, that's a big deal. Probably today, not so much because of our medical advancements. Um, so I have two moms, I like to say. Uh, the courageous one who um, made the decision uh, to not abort me and to continue with a pregnancy that she could have terminated easily and gone on with her life. Uh, and the other heroic mom who decided to step into the gap and uh, fulfill her destiny. And really, my story doesn't ever go anywhere without Dorothy Boyce. She is my everything. I literally have a picture of her on my desk right here, me and her as a young kid. Uh, she is literally my everything. Wouldn't be who I am, wouldn't have the values that I have um, if it were not for what she did for everyone that came into her path. And you know that because you stayed at her house and she was the mom to everyone. At a very young age, she grew up totally different than her parents and her brothers and her sisters. From, a, from being in third grade, she wanted to try and create a home and have a place for people that didn't have families. And so as a part of her mission in life over the course of uh, 15 years, she had over 40 foster care children. And at one point, she was the single mom of 11 children, right? And they're in the pictures that you see here. And as you can tell, mom's white and I'm black, 
right? One other um, African-American brother, Michael. Uh, but what you see there is diversity. And also, if I could just extend this just a little bit, what you see in front of you is what America looks like. We're all different. We all come from these different backgrounds, these different upbringings, these different um, places of understanding um, and experiences. Uh, my mom, of course, was a person who would take anybody in. She didn't care what you're, she says whether you are black, white, purple with polka dots, she doesn't care. She just wants to provide a home and a loving place and an encouraging environment to grow up in. Um, so wh while others might not want to take on special needs children, uh, my two brothers and sisters, Albert in the very middle with a red shirt, spina bifida because of what his mom decided to do when she was pregnant with him, paralyzed from the waist down, died early in life. My sister Leslie's maybe 46, 47 uh, with the mind of a three-year-old because of um, how she was impacted. Didn't matter to mom whether we were 10 days old like me or severely um the severely disabled mentally and physically didn't matter and then she treated us the exact same as she did those that were her birth children so she had four of her own children my brothers uh Bo, rick uh, dina and elizabeth um and she adopted six of us um and my stepdad who's his name is larry has three girls so we're a big family of 13 but at one time in life uh, it was just my mom uh, with 11 um, children by herself, trying to make it work. Um, God bless and, that woman. <laughs> amen. In time and in eternity. Um, yes. With lots and yes. lots of love and blessings. But she taught us at a very early age that we were built for something more. She taught us our inherent value um, came from our creation of, from the creator, from God. And there was a scripture that she had us memorize in Psalms 139 that says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made um, and that he covered us in our mother's womb. Each of us have been covered and had great care and attention that went into the creation of us as individuals, as human beings, as people. Um, and she wanted us to honor that no matter what our color was, our age, um, what our status in life is, our education, our, our socioeconomic status did not matter to her. Um, and I don't believe it matters to God either. Um, and so she taught us, I guess we say fearfully and wonderfully made in the King James Version, right? Um, but in a more modern contemporary way of saying that, mom taught all of us, regardless of our skin color, our background, our experience, that we were built for more. Um, and that we were created to do great things. And this is um, one of the things I, one of the quotes I always like to quote, um, because of the moment that we're in as a, as a society, is uh, one of my favorite quotes from Robert F. Kennedy, that some people will see things as they are and they'll ask why. Others will dream things that can be and ask why not. In other words, some people will see the racial division the mistrust, the hatred, the systemic racism, the discrimination, and use these as excuses to shrink from the opportunity of the moment, to do, do nothing, or to, yeah, just another, you know, dead African-American young boy, and we move on to the next story in a continuous 24-hour media cycle, right? There are some people who do that, who see the enormity of the moment and look at all of the past injustices, all of the times when it could have been made better, when it could have been made right, when there could have been reconciliation, and there wasn't, and they'll shrug those shoulders and walk on by. There are others, though, others, I believe, like my mom, um, like I believe a lot of our um, elected officials, a lot of our community activists, or just strip all that away, a lot of us just people, <laughs> just human beings, citizens of not just this country, but global citizens, um, are thinking differently and are looking at race and racism uh, in a different way. So that's how I would kind of start. Uh, I love, I love that. Um, in your book, um, I want to quote you if, you, if that's okay. In your book, you have this um, quote. It says, if we are willing to seek the common ground that comes from seeking higher ground, a post-racial society is nearer than we think. Yeah. What did you hear? Yeah, it is. Um, oh, I think. I w so you quote me. I want to actually quote Joel Olstein. 
Okay. He said it. I was reading our my declaration for today, mm -hmm. and he says, "You are closest to your victory when you face the greatest opposition." That's what uh, Joel Olstein says, um, and I believe that all of these. All of the history of injustice and opposition has, uh, cat like, has built and built and built and built and built to where each successive generation gets to look at this from a totally different lens. I mean, you grew up best friends, and there was never a thought that you were white and I was black. My best friend Philip and me um, grew up together. He was five; I was six. And we joked with each other that we were salt and pepper. That was our nicknames, right? And he was pepper and I was salt. I don't know why, but that's what we were, right? And I think that with all of the opposition pushing us the other way, there's this undercurrent, there's this undertow of a new generation of people. As old as my mom, I can't say she's in her 70s. She'll be mad. She they says she's always 23. And as young as you know, five years old. Um, I'll give you an example of why I'm so, um, why in the midst of this storm, I am encouraged and I have hope that the post racial society is nearer than we think. Before I was blessed to um, be back here in Orange County serving the mayor of Orange County, who's actually the first African-American mayor of Orange County and married to Val Demings, Congresswoman, uh, rumored to be a potential vice presidential pick. Um, and so he has an enormous weight on him right now, right? Dealing with COVID and dealing with this um, racial tension that's in our that's on our TV screens every night. But before I had this job, um, I was a I was bouncing around from job to job trying to find a full time job. But while I was doing that and giving speeches and things like that, I was a substitute teacher for the independent school district. Okay, so for about mm, between October and February, October of 2018 and February of 2019, I went to almost every elementary, um, middle school, high school in Independence to teach and be a substitute teacher, be a guest teacher for the day. And substitute teachers don't normally look like me um, or are male, so it was different. And it was so encouraging because there was not a whiff of racism anywhere. These kids, and I, and I subbed every single grade from K all the way through 12th grade, right? They were all actually engaging and talking about what was going on at the moment, um, whether it was in politics and things like that. It was a substitute teacher for a civics class, and, and they were actually engaging as teenagers and telling us, telling me what they thought about the current political situation. Like, I am amazed at the number of five-year-olds who know who the president of the United States is. <laughs> Like and, and they know and have opinions about him at very, like, these are like kindergartners um, and first graders that are telling me, of course, what their mom says about, right? So any right. one individual or leader, but like they're engaged and they're Hispanic. They were um, a lot of the blended classrooms uh, because of poverty and demographics. So you have Hispanic students who are five years old who are learning English in school. So the teacher has to know both Spanish and English. African-American students, all the only common thing they had was is that they were on um, Title IX funding. So they were on free and reduced lunch to everybody, most everybody. Um, and the way they treated each other, the way they engaged with each other, yeah, you had cliques. Yeah, you had, you know, the cool kids and et cetera, et cetera. But nothing was ever, ever about race. There was no prejudice that I could see or any discrimination amongst each other and with the administration, the teachers engaging with the students as well. And I saw so many empowering statements that are papered all throughout these schools and independence. And like people are saying, you know, they don't let God in schools. They don't let this. They don't let that. And I'm like, <laughs> These about as darn close as you can get because there's so many statements on leadership, on service, on caring about others. All common principles that come from God are being instituted and taught to our children in public schools. And yes, I was hopeful when I wrote the book in 2010, 2011, and even in the midst of the violence and the senseless acts of, of racism that we all witness, um, I have to have hope. Because 
ooh, when, when, when it's that close, when you're in the fourth quarter and you're winning, that's when they start fouling you, right? That's when yep. they start body checking you and you got to go to the line and shoot free throws. We're just, we just have to make our free throws. We're almost there. You know, I talk about in the book how, um, again, my mom is totally different than her brothers, sisters, and even her mom and dad. Her mom and dad were not my grandpa and grandma. Um, they actually disowned her and were discouraging of her being willing to foster care those who are different, of a different color, of a different skin color, um, or even had disabilities. And it was interesting because her grand, her father was, and you'll know this from our historic religious background, a patriarch, right? Mm-hmm. So that's one of the, like, and he... Um, Somebody, yeah. Because right? people aren't born hating people. They're taught that over the course of time and um and i learned that so when it came time for me to make my decision um in our faith tradition it's they typically throw you in the um baptism tank at eight um yeah. which is anyway a whole nother discussion for a whole nother day but i made a decision and and i love jesus and i make the same decision again today so i don't regret it any at all and my uncle who was a you know, servant leader, a minister of the church, it was, it was only rational that he would, you know, baptize me. And uh, he told my mom the night before my baptism, he says, I can't do it. Um, and it's because of how he was taught and how he viewed um, people that have my skin color. My own family um, would not help me and introduce me to the kingdom of God um, because he didn't believe that I had value and would ever be in the kingdom of God because of my skin color. Oh my gosh, that thing about that is um, later in life, um, uh, it was during the summer series, right? Big event um, during the summer um, coming together uh, for worship, song, uh, prayer, sermons, right? All that jazz. And he was there. He'd had a, a severe stroke. And uh, he came as a guest to my mom, and, and it was the last time I saw him, um, and he gave me a big hug. And he couldn't speak, um, but what I felt from that hug was this reconciliation and awareness and recognition of the sermon that I just gave and the impact it had on his life in that moment. And maybe the realization that, gosh, huh, God works with everyone regardless of what they're skin color is it really is about what their desires are and the content of their character and so while we did not speak this moment of recognition between us um that i still remember and when i was in washington dc in my earlier um in my earlier days in 2004 2003 he would write to me um and we would write back and forth um before he passed away and so that story of senseless injustice and unthinking unthinking type of prejudice had a silver lining has a silver lining to it and while i always share yes he wouldn't baptize me i also also make sure to share the other side of that that people can change um through experiences and i don't know what specifically when it triggered for him um that other people have value regardless of where they come from or their background or their ethnicity um but it was a really cool redemption story. The story that I hope that each of us who are honest and um, free thinking Americans on one hand and global citizens on the other are trying to engage and push the public discourse towards an awareness and a moment between that the moment that happened between me and my uncle might be a moment that happens between white people generally because that's where maybe systemic racism comes from um, and those of uh, um, skin of different colors of skin. Well, I think I shared this with you yesterday when we talked, but literally that's what we're talking about from, from chaos to community. And so that's a beautiful analogy of a chaotic, horrible, horrible moment. But from that, something beautiful actually emerged later on. I mean, years later, 20 years, uh, yeah. 25 years later, probably. Yeah. yeah. That's the other interesting thing is there are good people that do bad things um, based from experiences and what they've been taught, um, which helps me 
believe in and continue to have hope. If it's not inherent in our birth, it can be learned and unlearned. And that people, yes, get to a certain status, I say status, in terms of where they are in life and they don't change. I don't believe that. I believe anyone can change at any moment and at any time uh, based on circumstances of that moment. Um, and the moments before that, that lead up to, uh, that lead you from a moment to an actual movement, right? Just like you say, from this chaos to community. How can you transform that into something that's pretty cool? We have lots of examples throughout all of history, human history, and throughout scripture, where a bunch of really dysfunctional situations were made beautiful because of someone's willingness to change. This goes back to your quote from Kennedy, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Some people will see things as they are, not going to change. Others will dream things that can be and, and be the transformational leaders. And that's why I have hope. Again, because this moment, and not just because we're young, I say young, we're like in our 40s, right? We're technically pretty young, you know, and, and most right. of the people that have made most of the decisions that have shaped our lives are a lot older than us. But we have this generation right now of young and old, um, and you see it. And that's the other hopeful thing we see in our TV screens is they're taken to the streets and they don't care. I mean, like little kids are, you know, chanting no justice, no peace. Um, you know, older people are taking and doing whatever they can in the midst of a global pandemic to let their voice be heard um, in a very substantial and in historic numbers. I don't think we've seen this type of civic engagement um, before. And it's because this generation coming up is pretty smart, you know, and they're engaged and they're going to take us along with them, but they are why I am so hopeful. The people, the students that I helped substitute teach and was a guest teacher for are a huge part of the reason why that it's not just hope and faith. I see evidence. I can see the data. And I can see this big, horrible opposition, but this awesome undertow just about to like flip it. Flip the script is what we like to call it. I always encourage uh, people I talk to that it is our job to be agents of change. That we yeah. don't participate, that it's a choice. Change isn't something that happens to us. Um, change is something we participate in. And um, a, a friend and mentor of mine used to always say, don't let a thing happen to you you happen to a thing, meaning we engage, we involve ourselves, And so if we're called to be agents of change, I believe Jesus calls us into that same space. If we're called to be agents of change, what is a step? What is one step that we can take towards that change? Is it education? Is it conversation? In your opinion, as, as, a, as, a, as a black man, what is, what is it that you see that we can be doing? I think it comes from this overriding principle um, that is sowed into our nature, and it's be willing to be wrong about everything. Can you say that again? Be willing to be wrong. That's how I have grown. Um, and I'm not a big leader, but am you know involved in a lot of different civic and and in trying to help the community move forward by a number of different initiatives and, and boards that I've sat on in the past and sit on now. Um, and this is one of the things I always, when I'm talking to God by myself, I'm like, but I'm willing to be wrong. I'm willing to be wrong about everything I've been taught, everything I've learned. I've been, I'm because I've come from a specific point of view, um, being willing to just be wrong, whatever the issue is, whether it's the right religion or the right tie, right? right. Be willing to be wrong um, and then uh, be humble enough to seek information um, and change when you find out that you are wrong. Because some people hold on to it. It's like, but if I'm wrong and it's this way, then my entire paradigm of life just falls apart, right? You know, um, and, 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 and that's just how it is with some people. Um, but if you're willing to be a continuous learner 
and believe in continuous improvement. You know, these things that um, um, Dr. Stephen Covey talks about, you know, um, continuous improvement, sharpening your saw and, and your skill sets and, and continuing to learn and learn and learn. Um, I have continued to learn and learn and learn and every job I've had has just been so hard, but I've learned so much. And being willing to um, just be wrong about something or someone um, or about an opinion that you had or you know about something that I read or wrote back in the day and be willing to correct that. I'll tell, I'll give you an, a quick example of this. My birth mother, um, and I went back and um, real quickly over the course of 2015, 2016, um, I fell apart, fell apart, um, did all kinds of bad, right? Um, and struggled with some of the same things, substance abuse, those types of things that took my mom out when she was 19 and, and pregnant with me, okay? In the first version of my book, Never in a million years would I ever get caught up in drugs or do any of that kind of stuff. Never in a million, never even a thought, right? I did dare education, all that kind of good stuff, right? Never was a thought. Um, but then I came to this place of absolutely falling apart and everything in me shifted. So much so that I went back and in new um, editions of the book, I have a new forward in dedication to my birth mother. Well, I, where I specifically apologize to her, and I'll read it for you. To my birth mother, I love you, and I am so sorry for the picture of you I've had in my head all these years. I was wrong, wrong. Having struggled with some of the same things that you struggle with has tempered me and crushed me to powder. I can only imagine the incredible fight with substance abuse you had as a teenager. I'm in awe of you that you would go through with the pregnancy. I'm in awe of you that you would seek a better life for me than what you could have offered at the time. I love you and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I cannot wait for the day, either in this life or the next, when I, have, when I will be able to thank you personally for the life choices, you, for your life choices, for the life your choices have afforded to me. As a 35 and 36 year old, I've struggled with some of the same things that sought to destroy you. I understand your life and your sacrifices more now. And I am so sorry for how I've portrayed you. I'm sorry for the words in the original version. Specifically, I name what I need to um, make right. Uh, I refer to you as a crack whore. Uh, and I apologize because that's not who you were at all. You are a hero, a courageous person. And I cannot wait for the day when I can embrace you and tell you I'm sorry and express my regret and love face to face willing to be wrong when you go through it now honestly my pastor mike i don't have judgment for anybody like anybody i have you know you know you grow up with these different paradigms you're told this is right and this is wrong no judgment for anyone you just want us all to be willing to be wrong take a step towards each other and and as opposed to going like this open our hands and go like this Oh, I love that. Open our hands. Open Reach hand. out. Close this. That's right. I did an interview last week where she said we, she, what she sees is that we are reaching out and grabbing each other's hands right now. Hmm. That's good. Uh, Luke, that story, I, I, not, I had not heard that, that you had rewritten that about your birth mother. And I know. And in every speech that I give now, whether paid or free, I acknowledge and say, you know, I always talk about what my mom went through and what she struggled with. And then I say, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that I went through the same struggle she did. Because um, I'm not going to make myself out to be any better or any worse. It just life happens. <laughs> and I fell apart. Um, and I'm so thankful I got to fall apart because I was willing and learned how to be wrong about different people that dress different than me, uh, that love different than me, um, that look different from me. I literally have no judgment for anyone um, and it is because of what I went through and the uh, the relationship that I have with God now would never be as intense and as personal as it is if I hadn't gone through that absolute disaster and fell apart true story well you're not gonna do it so I am um, 
if you want to hear more about Lucas's story, uh, Lucas, tell him your website, actually. Sure. Um, so lucasdanielboyce.com, L-U-C-A-S, D as in dog, A-N-I-E-L-B as in boy, O-Y-C-E, lucasdanielboyce.com. Uh, you can go there. You can see some of my favorite quotes, um, favorite pictures. Um, you can actually download a free copy of the e-version of my book because um, I'm not really about trying to make money. I just want to um, just share. It's not really my story. It's a God's story through um, through a number of different people. It's him sharing himself and what he can do when you ask him to show up in your life. It's an example of that. It's an example of, of um, inclusion and uh, what is possible for all of us if we would take a step towards each other. Um, and then it's an example of um, asking, seeking, and knocking. And God takes you seriously when you take him seriously. When you ask, seek, and knock, and when my mom told me and asked me what my dreams were when I was 18, 19 years old, I told her that um, I wanted to be a missionary. I wanted to share my faith and be a minister for God, a servant leader. Uh, I wanted to work at the White House. I wanted to fly in Air Force One, uh, and I want to work for the Chicago Bulls. That was what I told her on graduation day. And over the course of 10 years, from age 19 to 29, I testify, it is my testimony, that the God of creation and his only begotten son said yes to every one of my goals. And I am just so incredibly thankful that they would see and value me enough to answer me in that specific way that mom said, dream big. Mom said, we can do anything we put our minds to. Mom said, remember who you are and who you represent. Uh, and I can't guarantee you success, but I can guarantee you that the likelihood for success will be that much greater. And after flunking kindergarten and being such a chaotic disaster to start, so blessed and still a moving disaster, just a little bit less disaster now than, than in the past. And um, I am living proof that God is alive. Um, and is engaged in the affairs of men and women. Well, Lucas, I am blessed to know you. I'm a better person because I do know you. Um, and I believe that um, everyone listening today and in the next few weeks is going to hear your story. Um, I believe that they will receive a blessing from it as well. So thank you for your time. They're encouraged. I hope that they feel empowered, and I hope that they continue to engage um, no matter where on the spectrum of belief, thought, philosophical um, knowledge and or theories they may or may not have about the current moment. But praying for each of them, each of them individually and asking that the God of creation would um, make this experience with you and me unique to what they need in their life at the moment um, that they might be ministered to. So not my strength, not my will, not any of my ability. You know this because you grew up with me. This was all God. This was Lucas. Lucas couldn't have made this stuff up. It was all God. So thank and you. It's the for power that. of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit uh, is a part of conversations, is in within us, it speaks to us. And we can look at somebody else and their experiences and relate to it and have empathy and connect in a way that we never thought possible before. And I believe that through our stories, through um, the stories we read in the Bible, through experiences that, and stories that you shared today, I believe that brings us closer together. I agree. So thank you for your time. Um, thank you for your, your art, your writing, your, your stories. And um, should we end in prayer? Yeah, that'd be good. All right. God, we thank you for Lucas. We thank you for his family. We thank you for Dorothy, his mother, and for Larry. And God, just everything that you have blessed Lucas with all the experiences, both good and bad, both chaotic and both of those that have brought him closer to other people. God, I want to pray a blessing on him as he continues in his life. God, may you continue to take chaotic situations in his life, God, and turn it back towards community. God, mm -hmm. back towards you and your love. God, thank you for his life. Thank you that he was able to share his experiences and his stories today. And God, I pray for every person and every soul that is listening right now. God, may your spirit touch them as the words from his lips reach their ears. May it speak to them. May they feel moved. May grace reach inside of their hearts. 
and wreck them. God, may that cause chaos, but may it bring us towards community. We thank you for these blessings and these opportunities. We pray these things in your name. Amen. 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 I love that song by Matthew West, To Do Something. My challenge to you is simple this week. You've heard Lucas' story. You've heard the stories in the Bible. Now is a chance that we can do something about it. So I'm calling everybody to do something about racism in our country, to do your part, whatever that looks like. Maybe that, maybe that means having a conversation. Maybe that means joining a club that's discussing a book. Maybe that means voting differently and spending your money differently than you have in the past. Whatever it means to you. I challenge you to do something this week. Go in peace.